Kia ora, talofa, namaste, hi mai, and welcome to this week's Niche Cache Variety Show, the first V show of 2023. Prior to this, we recorded our weekly Patreon podcast that also appears on the paid Substack subscription. We went deep into everything about the Black Caps based off uh, the question from Baxter Rogers, who sparked our Patreon podcast with a bunch of questions about Black Caps cricket. So if you are listening to the Variety Show and you are a member of the Patreon Fano, or you have subscribed to our paid Substack uh, newsletter as well, check those podcasts out. Otherwise, that's what we do on the Patreon podcast, and that's what we do for our paid Substack podcast as well. That is to say, a lot of black caps there. So we won't necessarily be going deep into black caps on the variety show. Well, we kind of do, but if you do want extra <laughs> black caps, it's there for the Patreon Fano and those very generous supporters of the niche cage content on the paid Substack as well. Busy times, Chieftain, in Aotearoa, in Aotearoa sport, festive period. Glorious sunshine and no wakan furries at all. Everything is honkadori here in Aotearoa. What's been a what's been a sneaky Aotearoa sports thing that has crept under the radar for yourself there? Um, I don't know if it's sneaky so much as well. It's sneaky in how it's crept back. It's not necessarily sneaky in itself, which is that the Flying Kiwis beat is just absolutely ramped back up again it was real dry for about six weeks it was a world cup hiatus you had a lot of the seasons were finished and um winter breaks and things like this and just not a lot of games going on we were outside of transfer windows so there was none of that well now there's a transfer window open and i'll talk about that later on um in this podcast and there's games happening there's all sorts it's um it's going a little bit bonkers and i like just over the last weekend i I watched Ryan Thomas play his first game for 461 days, I think it was, um, coming off the bench for, for Pick Swaller in the second tier of uh, Dutch football because they got relegated since he left them to go play for PSV. They're probably going to go straight back up this year, though, and especially with him back inside. So I watched a bit of that. That was a little bit tricky as well to try find... The, the sneakiest aspect of this is trying to find a stream for, for a game like that, where it's like second tier of Dutch football, a little bit harder to find. Haven't been in the habit of looking for these because there hadn't been any reason to. Same thing happened with Ben Wayne's game, and I couldn't get the clip of him being subbed on because the stream crashed. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't get a decent one going, and it's like 4 o'clock in the morning that game was on too. So uh, a bit of peskiness there, but I think the first game, once you try, once you start to figure out like which website's going to sort you out there, you, you get into a bit more of a rhythm. So got away with it with uh, Ryan Thomas, didn't get away with it Ben Wayne, but should do from now on, should be better at, at finding some of those things. Um, so yeah, the, 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 and that's just the start. Like that's just two examples of the flying Kiwis thing. I'll have to finish my article up and we, when we, uh, we finish recording this, it's, it's gone hectic again. It's like the good old days. I asked because throughout a very uh, busy super smash period and Kiwi cricketing period, suddenly we've got a uh, hockey world cup starting at the end of this week the black six men's are at the hockey world cup so that's going to be interesting also sneaking beneath the radar is the under 19 women's cricket world cup which is uh, interesting for a bunch of reasons obviously just curious how the kiwis go but you've also got a couple of white uh three white ferns playing and a bunch of super smash players also off to that under 19 world cup which starts later this week as well so we'll be covering those and now well, I'll do a you know, fair amount of niche case content on the website, but every Monday and Friday we serve up our newsletter and all sorts of Aotearoa sporting information is found in those newsletters sent out every Monday and Friday evening. We just update um, whatever's happening in Aotearoa sport or whatever we're thinking about. So sign up to that via Substack, the nichecase.substack.com. You can also sign up to a paid Substack through that email uh, newsletter subscription as well. Also, shout out to the Patreon fund at patreon.com forward slash El Niche Cash, E-L Niche Cash, which are uh, two of the best ways to support our content directly. And we also deliver an extra podcast for all our supporters there. You can make a 
direct donation or one-off donation through buy me a coffee all these links will be in the uh, description box and just set up the website the newstashcase.com big altero sporting yarns always to be found we've got a black caps test series debrief flying kiwis wellington phoenix content is there as well got the white ferns super smash mixer couple of warriors things you know just floating around and all sorts of other Aotearoa sporting content found there. Wildcard, we always start with a dose of mindfulness. It's a new year. Everything's the same. What do you got for your mindfulness? Yeah, Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching. A tree that cannot bend will crack in the wind. That seems especially pertinent in chaotic times. Yep, anything, <laughs> definitely. Chaotic times, which in case you... I'd love to be under a rock. I'd love to be full hermit mode, having no idea what is happening in the world, but got plenty of ideas about what is happening in the world. And you need to be able to bend. You need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to flow with the breeze and not get too rigid and where you're sitting or your perspective or your feelings just kind of flow a little bit through the chaotic times because i don't know apparently we've got a bit of a cyclone happening at the moment and if you're a rigid riggedy grumpy old tree you're gonna snap and then you're gone so you might as well want to just flow with the breeze yeah <laughs> i mean we're a a third of the way through January and summer hasn't happened yet outside of about three spare days. <laughs> it's um, definitely a bit of, a bit of uh, malleability, a bit of um, flexibility. These things definitely come in very handy. And I think just in general, I mean, because the obvious metaphor is having a fixed mindset versus having an open mind. I think in general, fixed mindsets not a very good thing like anytime you get people thinking like fundamentalist type of ways where it's like this this is what i believe and i will not accept any information that contradicts it i mean you might be right and there's no information to contradict it but you at least have to be open to the possibility of contradicting information and if you hear that contradiction you need to take it on board for what it's worth um as opposed to being like no i'm fixed in my ways i believe this and will not change not a very healthy way to get through life and also not a very productive way to get through life i would suggest as well probably got a fair example right now because everyone's got a idea on how summer should be yeah and fortunately unfortunately papa tuanuku and ranganui have different ideas and instead of being rigid and being like oh it's meant to be sunny it's meant to be hot well it's not so what are you going to do about it old matey Let's crack into some Aotearoa Sport wildcard. I'll give you the floor to start with. Very generous. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, sir. I will throw up some Wellington Phoenix thoughts as a result of that. I, I don't have any scientific way of proving this. Um, talking pure vibes here, but I reckon the Wellington Phoenix blokes are a team that are at their best, traditionally speaking at least, with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. Um, it's something that I remember watching Mark Rudin uh, emphasize in his very first press conference with the team when they unveiled him. You know, I, I remember, specifically remember him sitting there being like, look, I, I understand that the Knicks are going to cop some tough decisions. I know that we can't sign the best Australian players out there. I know that it's harder for us than anyone else with the travel. I know that like uh <laughs> phoenix tend to get shunned by the a-league establishment a little bit being a new zealand team in an australian competition where not everybody actually wants them to be there you know and i think rudin's hard-edged mentality it it reached a point like it reached it reached a um point of uh, diminishing returns but it did initially i think he does get a lot of credit for helping turn a struggling club around um and of course, he gapped it for a better gig at the first opportunity, but all good because if Octale replaced him and if Octale has a way better coach. Um, Rudin's team needed that fire because they weren't tactically profound or anything like that. You know, they they had to work harder and, and be gritty and whatnot to, to beat teams. Whereas Talai's come in and 
he's a tactician. Like he knows how to win a game with uh, like setting up his team in certain ways and how to combat oppositions and, and be the proactive team rather than just reacting to what the opposition gives you. And his Wellington Phoenix teams have won a lot of respect, I think, around the league specifically for like you know there's some silky football that they've played there's some excellent player development and also of course the the COVID sacrifices and stuff like that gets to get you a sort of an element of sympathy as well with um to go with the respect from from around the league and these days I think the Wellington Phoenix are just an organization that a lot of neutrals around the league quite enjoy the presence of and I wonder if maybe that's caused them to lose a bit little bit of that edge that they used to have because coming into the season Huge and justified expectations, I would suggest as well. I remember I wrote about how this could be the best season they've ever had. Like it's the best prepared they've ever been coming into a season. And yet what we've seen is a team that's dropped 12 points already from winning positions across their first 10 games. There was some softness in either penalty area, stopped them from capitalizing on what is otherwise pretty excellent play across the rest of the pitch. Just like, you know, conceding sloppy goals, not converting all their best chances. You know what gets that chip back on the shoulder? <laughs> two dodgy red cards and two dodgy penalties awarded against them in the final 20 minutes and change of a game away against a traditional A-League powerhouse in Sydney FC. You know what really gets that fire in the belly burning again? Still winning despite two dodgy red cards and two dodgy penalties. It's not exactly a method of victory that you want to turn into a habit or anything like that, but at this exact moment of time, might just be what the Swelly next team needed to get their previously stuttering season rolling, you know? Chip on the shoulder, fire in the belly, heaps more silky oofy ball. 2022-23 Wellington Phoenix may have finally arrived. Beauty, I'm sticking with the uh, the divine connection here and the vibe of the Black Caps versus Pakistan Test Series. Because it was weird. It was quirky. It was funky but also oh funky it was a uh, it was an interesting test series and that starts with just playing a test series in pakistan at this time of year you know spending our wet summer evenings watching test cricket in pakistan and all the games are in karachi and chris harris is on commentary simon Dill's on commentary and scott styrus is on commentary and they're doing some very corny Pakistani ads and the whole thing just looked a bit weird and a bit strange and unfamiliar for the Kiwi cricket fan and I think that flowed into the cricket the only thing that was stock standard you know this fits into a nice square was Kane Williamson Tom Latham and Devin Conway scoring runs other than that, it was just a whole lot of just really interesting test cricket. E. Shodi took a bunch of wickets. Michael Bracewell was playing as the as a really good spinner. E. Jas Patel was there. You had uh, Tom Late, Tom Bundle scored runs. Obviously, Tim Salvey, captain. That's new. That's weird. Kane Williamson, not captain. That's new. That's weird. And I'm not sure how much of it to take with me on my summer travels i'm not clinging to anything from that test series i don't know what is going what we're going to learn from that test series coming into the england test series and then the test series against sri lanka in the back end of the kiwi summer and all of it all of which is to say there was a fun test series and a weird test series and i don't know i don't know what else to do with it. i don't know what to do with this test series it was a draw thousands of karachi cricket fans were there in attendance sipping their sensitive uh teeth juice and um playing cricket at the lunch break and chanting when nothing was happening it was just the whole thing was just fantastic and weird and i think we just keep it moving how about that we just keep it moving this odi series is happening i don't even know what's happening there i should know but I don't really know. And we'll just keep it moving to when the, some... When summer comes back. Like, how about we just get some summer? Wait, wait, wait. I need to flow in the breeze here, Wildcard. Let's keep it yeah, moving. You, gotta, you don't want to be... <laughs> I'm snapping. The tree is snapping. I need to turn into a uh, a subtle... What is it? A subtle? Subtle? Not subtle. Um, but I need to become a flex bush. Bendy. You got to bend, sure, yeah. You got to bend like the flex bush. Nimble. It sounds like you need a tapal T moment. Yeah, I do. 
I'll sit in, I'll sit in my little uh, red little nook with all my other homies. Uh, it's let's the get... synchronized sipping that got me with those. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone at once. And it was the same chick in the background, like serving up the tea the whole yeah. time. That was interesting. While we're on these weird, quirky Kiwi cricketing notes here, big up Ian Smith. Had a fun time. Like that just felt a lot more comfortable. Ian Smith chuckling along to Kerry Old Kerry Old Kerry Old Keith and Kerry O'Keefe, um, and Ian Smith just being the resident Kiwi on a Australian commentary team who apparently need all the help they can get. Statistical We're in Shane Warne's seat, so <laughs> yeah, where to bring it down there? Uh, statistical funkier wildcard. What do you got? So there's, there's a reason they need the help there. Um, Black caps. Uh, home and away stats. This is what I've been thinking about. One of the main things I was sort of pondering during that series is the um, the obvious difference between, you know, doing your job at home, doing your job away. It's the hardest thing in test cricket really is to, to be successful away from home, to go to all these different conditions that you're not used to and, and perform at such a level that you're sort of can be successful. Um, and so I went just nice and quickly, whipped through, put some of this and put the, the overall numbers in the, um, in the email on Monday as well, if anyone wants to have a closer look, but just breezing through a couple of things that I noticed just from these specific, this specific Black Caps team and their home and away differentials, obviously you're going to do better at home, right? It just seems like the natural thing to say is you know, the conditions that you're more used to, the conditions that you came up, um, developed your game within, probably the most important factor of those conditions where you're just more comfortable and you play them more regularly, you're probably going to score more runs, for example. And that's the case for someone like, you know, Kane Williamson averages 53.49 at home with 1200s. The difference is the difference between like, because I think all the great players are going to have similar. I expect Joe Root scores more runs in England than he does uh, anywhere else, like his average. But Steve Smith, his average at, in Australia, obviously going to be better. Probably the same with Virat Kohli in India for those same reasons. The difference is you just you can't have too much of a drop off when you go away. You're not going to score as many or as often away, but you still got to have those big innings. You still got to be a contributing guy. So Kane Williamson, fifty three point four nine at home, forty five point nine away. If that was just as the entirety of his career, he just averaged 45.9, he's still pretty bloody good. 1,200s as well. He's got the same amount of the 100s away from home as he does in Aotearoa. That's pretty outstanding. Like, that's world-class. Both those things are world-class. That's the, that's the benchmark everyone else is trying to get to. Tom Latham, 47.03 uh, average at home with 700s. 44.92 with 600s away. Also really good. Like there's not much difference between that. There's a drop-off, obviously, but there's going to be, and it's not too big of a drop-off. Um, so Devin Conway, same thing. So it's early in his career, so it's a little bit more skewed, but he averages 64.6 with 200s at home, 50.8 with 200s away. Really good. Um, interesting things with like guys like Daryl Mitchell, for example, who's averages 47 with 100 at home, actually averages 66.3 with 300s away. And Tom Blunder was similar, 38.6 with 100 at home, 46.1 with 200s away. Um, probably early in their careers is why there's a bit of a skew, but you've also seen both those guys step up, you know, Tom Blunder scoring 100 at the MCG, Daryl Mitchell's series tour of, uh, tour of England last year, scoring all those runs when no one else was. Um, impressive things. The flip side is Henry Nichols, average of 48.02 at home with 700s. Again, world class. Like that's better than Tom Latham's average in New Zealand. However, Tom Latham averages a shade under 45 away, whereas Nichols' average drops from 48 to 26.3 with only 100 away. That 100 was against the UAE, uh, against Pakistan in the UAE the previous time that we saw it away there, which technically speaking, um, nitpicking a little bit because this was where Pakistan played all their test cricket, but technically speaking, that's a neutral venue. So yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the example you don't want to follow. Um, and probably putting a little bit of a pressure on himself there, but... Looking at the bowlers, um, no surprises. Tim Southey, 26.9 at home. Trent Bolt, 25.04 at home. Neil Wagner, 26.15 at home. All just fantastic numbers on those Kiwi green seamers. All still pretty good away, though. Like, there's, a, there's a bit of a tear thing here where Southey's average is 32 away, Bolt averages 30 and a half, and then Wagner's 28 and a half. So sort of like a two-run drop-off between each of them. But it was still also... 
all very good. And I think Salvi as well probably balances those numbers out if you take out the first couple of years of his career, I suspect. I haven't looked into this, but I suspect because he started playing test cricket quite young and his, his average was relatively high to begin with and he brought it down steadily over the course of his career. I suspect if you look just... I don't know, in the last 10 years specifically, I think his away average would be a lot better. He does have six five-wicket bags away from home, um, more than any other current player. Uh, well, we'll skip Kyle Jamison for this one. Um, look at the spinners. Spinners are very interesting because they're the one flip side where the home conditions just don't help you and the away conditions very much do. So uh, Michael Bracewell's never played a test match at home. AJS Patel has played test matches at home, but hasn't taken any wickets in any of them. And East Sodi's played a handful and has five wickets at 93.8 average. So that's, his, that's their home thing. Away from home, however, Sodi, who's only just got back in the test team after about a five, six year absence. Um, and again, like Salvi, numbers probably skewed from having played test cricket very young. And unlike Salvi, didn't get to play through the last few years when he's coming in around his prime. Um, didn't get to fix those numbers so much because he wasn't playing. But his away average is 37.75. He took a five-wicket bag against Pakistan in this most recent one. That's pretty good. Like, that's not bad for a spinner who's not been first choice for that time. AJS Patel's is even better. 29.25 is his away average. And Michael Bracewell, just a cheeky 46.23. But he was pretty good in Pakistan when conditions suited a guy who gets to elevate himself when in favorable conditions from a part-timer to a to a full on the flip side here another Cantabrian we had Henry Nichols with the with the um, batters and now we've got Matt Henry with the bowlers Matt Henry 34.2 average at home 47.71 away unfortunately for Matt Henry he doesn't play very many consecutive tests and it's probably going to change now I think he's going to start playing more regularly with the continued uh, or just less regular presence of Trent Bowl. And that his one five-wicket bag in test matches came, I think it was seven for, wasn't it, against South Africa last summer? So he's, he's in a much better place. But yeah, the away number needs some work, 47s. He, he, didn't, he didn't improve it playing in Pakistan. Um, unfortunately for him, he's played two separate test matches in Australia already in his career, despite only playing 13 overall. So we'll give him benefit of the doubt for now and say that's why. But um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of work-ons there from the old home and away uh, differentials i am going to deliver a statistical vitamins revolving around dean foxcroft the otago all-rounder who is currently first in super smash runs and first in super smash wickets dean foxcroft has foxcroft has nine wickets and an average of 8.88 and an rpo of five Dean Foxcroft has also scored 198 runs at an average of 49.5 and a strike rate of 120. Dean Foxcroft, in his T20 career, he has a batting average of 43.35 and a bowling average of 23. That batting average is good enough to be ranked 7th all time. He's not quite hitting the marker of Devin Conway, who averages 44. Or, shout out Chris Harris, a lot of airtime in this episode of The Variety Show. He is still first with an average of 70.6. But Dean Foxcroft has entered the all-time T20 batting average charts. Ranked 7th with an average of 43.35. He's currently the best Super Smash batter, the best Super Smash bowler, probably just the best player in Super Smash. Deep in the Mangroves wildcard. It's been a while. Hopefully you're you're still you're still alive and uh, haven't. I'm sure you lost your jandals. I'm sure you've uh, had to get the kayak out because it's been a bit swampy, a bit flooded in those mangroves. But you made it. Yeah, more than a bit flooded, I think, um, given recent weather patterns. But you know, the kayak will do you right. Um, drifting along through the mangroves and trying not to get your oar stuck in the in the reeds there um i yeah I, in light of that i'm just gonna play a little bit of catch up here because the january transfer window is open in european football and that means that flying kiwis doings are afoot 
So just before the, so I'll just run through some of the um, couple of transfers and a couple of impending uh, ones to keep an eye out on. Just before the window, about you know early December, we had Erin Naylor joining Nurkopping in Sweden, where she played last year for a newly promoted side, Umea FC, and they got relegated, newly promoted, then got relegated again. She's just joined a newly promoted side, so hopefully not going to repeat the dose, but I think there are quite significant differences there, whereas Umea had seen that's been promoted and relegated like three times in the last decade. This is Nor Kopping's first time in the top division in Swedish women's football, but they have been a regular presence in men's football at the top tier, and actually in the sort of 40s and 50s, they were the powerhouse club in, in Sweden, so I think it's a case, whereas she was playing for a yo-yo team before, now she's playing for a team that's got promoted because they've suddenly started investing in their women's team and like taken it seriously and they've gotten quite good. Um, so that's good. That's a, that's a nice sign, especially in a World Cup year, of course. Nando Pineke, he's made his stay at Sligo Rovers, a permanent one in Ireland. He's transferred from Rio Ave in Portugal, where he never really got a look in for the first team. Um, was playing regularly in Ireland, though, so he's back uh, teaming up with Max Mata once more, who they've, those two guys have played together a lot throughout their careers. Um, Mata re-signed last year with a new contract, and Pinek has now made his move there a permanent one. Ollie White and Logan Rogerson also late last year, both re-upped with the FC Haka in Finland. A couple USL championship moves, second tier in America. Moses Dyer's moved from Canada to FC Tulsa. Elliot Collier actually won the USL last year with San Antonio, but he was he, he played a lot at the start of the season. Then he got injured and was out for a couple of months. And when he came back, he was basically just a bench option. But he did get on the field uh, late on in the, um, in the grand final, won a title. And because he's won a title, now he gets to go pick a team where he might actually get to play more regularly. So he's chosen San Diego Loyal, which means he'll be teammates of Kyle Adams, another Kiwi there. Um, Declan Wynn as well, switching from Detroit City to Charleston Battery. Charleston Battery sounds like... It was more like something you'd buy at the um, at the mechanics, but I don't know. Apparently, it's a football team. Um, then we come to the real big yarns. Ben Wayne, Plymouth Argyle. Everyone's heard about that. I've already written a full article about that one. Made his debut on the weekend, switching from the Wellington Phoenix for a fee as well, joining uh, Libby Kikache, um, Saprit Singh in recent years, moving academy products from the Phoenix who have signed with European clubs for transfer fees. Several more poised. Uh, Oli Kalotti, Oliver Kalotti from the New Zealand under 19s. He was joint top scorer in the uh, under 19s Oceania Championship. So qualifying for this year's under 20 World Cup. Joint top scorer there for the New Zealand team. Um, also top scorer for Melville United in the National League. Most recently, he's been on trial at Sheffield Wednesday for the last couple of years, which is especially funny because Sheffield Wednesday is second in League Two behind Plymouth Argyle. Plymouth Argyle signed Ben Wayne. A day after Ben Wayne makes his debut, Sheffield Wednesday decide, well, we got to get in on this buzz and sign ourselves a Kiwi striker as well. So they bring Oli Kalotti over on uh, trial. Unfortunately, he strained a hamstring within the first couple of days of being over there. I've just seen this this morning. So that could put him in a little bit of jeopardy. Um, there was also a hint in that article that there might be a Premier League team interested in, in having a look at him on trial as well. So... Um, Hopefully that all works out all right for a dude who's one of our best striker prospects. The most consequential of all of these would be Marco Staminic, who just this morning as well has been announced that he is not going to sign a new contract with FC Copenhagen. This amidst some pretty significant transfer rumors that he might move to his father's native Serbia to play for Red Star Belgrade. Um, a powerhouse club of the past. Again, uh, the, the top team in Serbia. A team who, like Copenhagen qualifying for European competitions pretty much every year. Red Star Belgrade will be playing some Champions League, uh, uh, what do you call them, preliminaries most likely if they go on and win their league. They're interested in Marco Staminic, who would count as a local player for them. I suspect the fact that he's just said he's not, uh, that the club have just announced he's not going to re-sign with Copenhagen means we can probably hope for something, some news there in, in the next couple of days. Also, I think Matt Garbett, at Torino hasn't been in the hasn't been in the uh, Serie A squad for the last two games, amidst speculation that he'll be heading down a division or two for some experience out on loan, get some first team football. And while he's not a New Zealander, there's also some pretty big buzz around Empoli fullback Fabiano Parisi, uh, because if that Joker leaves, and there are a lot of clubs out for him, 
Libby Kakacha gets a gets a gets an open run at the starting gig if that happens. So there's plenty of stuff going on. Could also be plenty more that you never know about because a lot of these transfers they don't just happen amongst like uh, wells of speculation. You just like wake up one morning, whip on your phone, and say, "Oh, so and so signed for such and such." Didn't see that one coming. So not in, not even halfway through the month yet. Who knows what exciting events may be before us yet? Flying Kiwis transfer tracker. We'll be keeping an eye on that one in our emails, but certain as well as the Flying Kiwis themselves. Let's take a paddle through the Woman Super Smash with the White Ferns mixer where Susie Bates is leading all run scorers and she's in fine form. And I just generally think the top group of White Ferns that I've got written down here, you've got Bates, Divine, Amelia Kerr, Maddie Green, those four batters and three of them are now bowlers with Bates bowling as well. They're all pretty decent in the Super Smash. The only kind of issue there is Divine hasn't scored runs, but she's already been one of the best bowlers. So what do we know about Sophie Divine? One of the best batters in the world, one of the best cricketers in the world. She will probably smash 100 in the next game if she does play because um, she's kind of picking her spots and that's all good. I think the spinners have been pretty solid as well. Fran Jonas is Auckland's best bowler. She's off to the Under-19 World Cup, so how Auckland deal with that loss will be interesting. Eden Carson is trucking along nicely as a T20 spinner, and Amelia Kerr, don't expect her to be the best spinner, but she's an excellent spinner to have tucked away, and you've still got that spin trio of Amelia Kerr, Fran Jonas, and Eden Carson, all of whom have been pretty solid in the Super Smash. The best seamers are Jess Kerr, and Leah Tahuhu. Leah Tahuhu has monstrous batting strike rates in both Halliburton and Johnston Shield and Super Smash, but you can't overlook Jess Kerr in that regard as well. She is smashing boundaries herself, very fine cricketer. They are the two best seamers. And I think the best, the biggest winner from the Super Smash has been Hannah Rowe and her all round ability for Central Districts. They haven't won a game. But Hannah Rowe is consistently bowling outswing, and she is uh, playing an aggressive middle order role for the White Ferns as well. Which, when you consider that Brooke Halliday hasn't played yet, Lauren Down isn't even Auckland's best batter, and then you're looking at the Georgia Plymouth Rebecca Burns batting group, who are I'm quite high on those two just because of the role they have within Wellington, and that's going to be the same role they will have with the White Ferns, where it's all about strike rates and hitting as many runs out off as few deliveries as possible. None of them have <clears throat> actually dominated, though, and I think that presents an opportunity for Hannah Rowe and her all-round ability to crack into that T21st 11. Georgia Plimmer, Izzy Gaze, and Fran Jonas have gone off to the Under-19 World Cup, so we'll be tracking them to see if they dominate because they are white fans playing an Under-19 World Cup. They should dominate or at least lead Aotearoa for runs and wickets. Izzy Gaze hasn't scored many runs, neither has Jess McFadgen in the wicketkeeper ranks, but Jess McFadgen does have a strike rate of 130, which is only based off 10 balls. So again, comparing her role there to the role in the White Ferns is more similar to what Izzy Gaze is doing, but I reckon Maddie Green is the best T20 wicketkeeper available. Hayley, jo Hayley Jensen wasn't that great in the Women's Big Bash League, and she's been okay in the Super Smash, so keen observers will be looking for improvement from Hayley Jensen as well. And I think the batting role player and an extra seam spot, because Molly Penfold is okay, but she's not dominant, and we want our White Ferns to be dominating the Super Smash, so I think there's an opportunity for... Hannah Rowe to really leapfrog a few of those players in the T20 mixer for the White Ferns, but the T20 World Cup is going to be based around Susie Bates, Sophie Devine, Amelia Kerr, Jess Kerr, Maddie Green, Leah Tahuhu, and the spinners, Jonas and Carson. All of them are playing pretty good cricket in the Super Smash and setting themselves up nicely for any White Ferns cricket coming up. Wild card, I've got a question for you. Where does Ryan Rayan? Rupier rank for New Zealand Breakers next stars because I kind of love him. I quite like him too. I'm very skeptical and have been for a while about the next star, next star experience. I think um, in general, 
they don't really help teams to win. They're bringing in effectively a rookie, someone probably less than a rookie in terms of ex- like uh, professional experience and then asking them to play in a very competitive, fast-paced league. And um, it's not worked out great for the breakers. I also don't suspect it's worked out that well. It hasn't done a terrible thing for, for the players themselves in terms of NBA draft ranks, but I don't know that they've finished. I, I don't know that they've been drafted anywhere different than they would have been otherwise because they played for the breakers. That being said, don't know if repair will get drafted higher than Usman Dieng, who went to the Thunder at like, what was it, like 11, 12, 13 or something in the draft. I'm not sure if repair will get there, but he could. And I definitely think he's been the best of the breakers things, largely because he can actually do a little bit of defending. He's he's athletic. He's just a little bit sharper, a little bit more refined in that way. He's got good like good length. And he's got a jump shot, which isn't the most reliable, but it's more reliable than the guys have had before in those situations. He's actually getting minutes that aren't just given to him because he's a next star. He's getting minutes because he's earning them. I think he's been quite good too. I, he's just come back. I think his best game was his first game back from, from injury. So we'll see how he goes over the rest of the season because I think maybe that timeout actually probably quite helped him sitting on the sidelines watching, learning the ropes. Question back the other way. A couple of times towards the end of last year, you mentioned that you, you're starting to feel a little bit of cautious optimism towards the, oh, I almost said Vodafone Warriors, the the one NZ Warriors um, ahead of the next NRL season. Uh, a lot of people say this every year about the Warriors. Um, I trust your opinion a little bit more than most. So what, we'll outline your reasoning there. Where's, where's your optimism coming from? Cautious optimism, I should specify. Well, it's a quite an extensive question you're asking me. So I don't want to like go <laughs> deep into the mangroves for just this question, but I will. So I want to provide a different answer to a lot of the stuff that I've written in the email newsletters and um, articles published. Like they've got a solid spine. That's great. I, they've got some good juniors there from Aotearoa. That's cool. They returned to SG Ball in New South Wales Cup. That's great. They've got Andrew Webster. He was at the Panthers. He's got a good understanding of Polynesian, young Polynesian men. He worked with way uh up he the panthers that might help wade egan i actually think bunty Foa might be a contender for the starting prop role and andrew webster was working with moses liotta so bunty Foa could receive a development boost there but i'm going no dramas there's no dramas with the warriors there's never dramas with the warriors you look at some of these australian nrl clubs they love a bit of drama and if, you, if you're at the Warriors right now, you just want to be mellowing out. You just want to be chilling out, doing your mahi. you got an owner. Again, everyone hates the owner, but the owner spends money. you got ownership who spends money. Cameron George has kept the ship afloat. Warriors still exist in Aotearoa. And players aren't, you know, out there doing cocaine, beating up women. They're not out there, you know, getting in fights with other NRL players or saying their coaches shit. You know, the Warriors are just chilling. So let's not attacking ourselves. tradies on the roof with a hammer or anything Ooh, like uh, that. Yeah. The old uh, the old dragons drama musical jam wild card. I just want to shout out an ancient project, a fascinating project. DJ Louis Slippers, ten pound bag, classic underground British hip hop that you cannot go wrong with. Just search Louis Slippers on YouTube; it will be there for you. Some of the best hip hop you'll ever hear. Your musical jam wild card. Beauty. Yeah, well, all I've been listening to lately is the the top 10 albums of last year that I put together. That as well as the top 20 Aotearoa albums that we've put together combined. So those two articles, both live, get amongst them. Big up yourself, love yourself, kia kaha, stay beautiful. More podcasts coming up on Thursday. Big up yourself. Cha-cha.